Hello again. Let's talk about newspaper comics in America. To begin with, I really want to look at the culture of American newspapers because they're quite different from European newspapers in many respects. And what really changes them comes into force in the 18th century when they move away from being vehicles of information to provide a kind of civic service to this fledgling democracy. And instead, they become entertainers and really focus their business model on attracting audiences through various means. To begin with, the story really starts in 1835 when the owner of the Sun newspaper, Benjamin H. Day, agreed to create a story with his chief editor, Richard Locke, who wrote under the pseudonym Dr. Andrew Grant. And what he did was create a report on a new astronomical discovery where they found life on the moon. Now, this sounds rather incredible and hardly very believable, but at the time, this was something that many people thought still possible. And the way in which they sold this story was rather ingenious. They attached it to a famous astronomer, Sir John Herschel, who happened to be at the time in South Africa. So there was no easy way to confirm or deny the story. And they spent a great deal of time talking about this extraordinary telescope, uh, sort of bolstering the scientific credo of this report and really going into detail about its unique features before then delving into this complete fantasy about life on the moon. For about a week, they issued a number of reports uh, elaborating more and more about the curious customs of the life on the moon. And eventually it was uncovered as a hoax. The paper made no apology and didn't seem to suffer for its uh, adventure in extravagant lying. In fact, its popularity grew and it had a wider circulation after the moon hoax than it did before. And so this is the way in which newspapers began to really move toward greater and greater sensationalism. And it becomes quite a troubling problem when we get to the beginning of the 20th century. Now, one of the ways in which newspapers were able to become sensational was through illustration and through satirical comics and uh, prints. Thomas Nast was one of the great champions of illustrated reporting. He worked during the Civil War and did many images of the action there. But he also did a lot of social commentary and politics and did a very famous series on the corruption in New York City, the Tammany Hall Tigers. But Thomas Nast is also famous for creating just really iconic images that have stuck with us all the way down to the present day, including the Democratic Donkey and Santa Claus, who was depicted as jolly old Saint Nick. Here we have uh, Santa Claus visiting the troops in the Civil War, passing out toys. Another really fascinating feature that became popular in the humor magazine St. Nicholas in 1883 was the series by Palmer Cox called Brownies. This series of satirical images involved a troop of midget fairies called brownies after the Scottish tradition. And the brownies would go into public spaces at night when everyone was away, and they would sort of act out being human. And in this case here, we have them all in the schoolhouse uh, trying to become students and teachers. 
and this is sort of the the humor of the brownies they are a kind of troop of various immigrants who seem to have a difficulty understanding the fascination of the human world and this way it becomes a way of looking at America at this time that immigrants were in a sense trying to figure out what it means to be an American and the brownies were sort of dramatizing that awkwardness. The brownies were also employed in a number of books where various stories and adventures took place. One peculiar one from 1900 involved the brownies in the Philippines which a, engaged them in the military skirmishes in the Philippine-American War, where they were advancing the colonial causes of the United States. The Brownie comic was so widely known that Kodak took the Brownie on as its own brand and helped it ce celebrate its new popular personal camera now, the Brownie was a huge success, and it allowed Kodak to become a household name. Curious enough, though, Kodak never paid Palmer Cox any royalties for his comic creation, because at the time, copyright really only applied to reproducing existing works. So any cartoon that Palmer Cox made could not be reproduced. But any residual thing that he created or someone else created out of those ideas was not copyrightable at this time. Another really important change that takes place in newspapers is the invention of offset color lithography and the linotype press. Now, offset color lithography is like an evolution in lithography where you have an image on a stone that you impress on the paper. Offset lithography is where you take a roller and you roll it over the stone and you pick up the image there and then you transfer that image onto the paper. By using this roller across the stone to pick up the image, you create a very accurate impression on the paper that goes much quicker. You can mechanize the entire process. And so offset color lithography allowed for huge innovations in the use of multiple colorful spreads. And this added to the attractiveness of the newspaper. The linotype press was an extraordinary invention that allowed for the type to be created at a much faster rate. And then in 18... 96, these two inventions came together to create the Sunday Color Supplement. This was an advertising bonanza. At a time when most people would not read the newspaper, they would be leisurely about the house uh, doing other things, uh, the Sunday Color S Supplement allowed the newspapers to market to this leisure time by including more stories about um, you know, fashions and and sports and whatever kinds of events that people took their leisure in. Now, the linotype press was a really amazing contraption. It took many, many years to develop, and it was incredibly complicated. What it allowed was, instead of using individual cast letters put together into a frame, to print your page, which is the way it had been done since the time of Gutenberg, the linotype press allowed a publisher to merely type their text into the machine, and the machine would create a wax positive that would then be made into a lead type, which was not an individual letter, but a whole line of text that then could be immediately popped out and put into a frame and published. And then when you were done, you didn't have to take your frame apart and resort all of your letters. You could just molt, throw it back into the machine and it would melt it down to create a new day's news. 
So this was a really important idea because you had this whole army of people whose whole job it was to put together the frames letter by letter and pack it all together. And then a whole army of people whose sole job was to take them all apart and reassemble them for the next day's news. So by having this machine, they were able to dramatically increase the size of the newspapers and the amount of content they were covering. The other innovation that comes from Benjamin Day, our former owner of The Sun, he developed a process of color separation that allowed for uh, these dots of fields of dots to reproduce a whole range of colors. This became an especially efficient and effective way to produce a wide range of colors with only using a handful of primary inks. These became known in the business as the Ben Day Dots for Benjamin Day. As the Sunday color supplement became popular, it, entertaining uh, options were comics. And so these one panel funny satirical comics became an important feature in the Sunday color supplement. Richard Occult was especially popular in his depiction of street urchins in the urban landscape of New York. Here, two kids are talking about uh, the death of one of their brothers. And she says, say, Liz, is your brother Patsy dead? Sure he is. And he died a terrible dead, too. That poor kid couldn't eat nothing for two days before he croaked. And he had to die hungry, right? Here, within a stone's throw of Thanksgiving. And so this sort of dark humor in this uh, broken English is a way of kind of bringing us into f focus the, the lives of ordinary Americans in New York City. Another curious thing about this comic is this little kid in the background with the yellow shirt. Occult began adding him into his comics sort of as a visual feature, something that might catch your eye and wonder, what's that kid doing there? And is this anything to do with him? And typically not. He was just there to kind of catch your attention. Who is this strange, bald-headed kid? As the feature grew in popularity and in size, the yellow kid always became this very prominent character. With his bald head and his stained smock, he was a kind of idiot, mongoloid creature who would be there to sort of make you wonder what's going on here. In this uh, feature, now called Hogan's Alley, the kids were often at playing at being upper class uh, peep adults, such as the game of golf, where they're having a real row of it. The yellow kid, who later became known as Mickey Dugan, was enormously popular. More and more advertisers picked up on the popularity of that kid and began attaching him to their ads. And like Palmer Cox's brownie, they didn't pay occult any royalties for this. Some people, out of the kindness of their heart, a kind of gentleman's agreement, agreed to pay him something. But it was really not within the copyright law to have this uh, arrangement. And so a lot of the merchandise that was created here was created entirely in the interest of the people who were just exploiting the popularity of this comic character. Now, here we see the yellow kid in all its glory, a giant full page comic, which you can really pour over in the Sunday colored supplement. And as it grew in size, there became more and more text and more and more action, so that you really took quite a while to sort of pour over this adventure. This would be you call um, a monoscenic narrative with conflation, meaning it's not a single event, it's many events all kind of piled up together. Now, the yellow kid here, you'll see on his smock, 
is no longer just stained. It's actually where his voice is. He is speaking uh, from the, 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 the words on his shirt. And this became something sort of like a placard that people would wear down the street uh, announcing they were selling something. And that's sort of the convention that Occult developed for this particular strip. I will point out, though, in the background in various places, he began using speech bubbles with his characters, a practice which had been largely forgotten about for almost a hundred years, now slowly makes its stealthy return. And here, on October 25th, 1896, Occult brings together the idea of a sequential narrative, and in it, he has just the yellow kid now, and the yellow kid is talking and to us about this new invention, the phonograph. And the phonograph is talking in speech bubbles. This is a really interesting dynamic here. Eventually, the parrot pops out of the phonograph in surprise we have the speech bubble coming out of the yellow kid's shirt, as if suddenly the voice of the character can come directly from him. It's a very curious little shift in the relationship of where is the voice really in this comic. Now, the phonograph had been around since 1878, and not coincidentally, Occult had actually worked with Edison and promoting his inventions at the World's Fair. So he was very familiar with the sense of shock and surprise and wonder that many people felt in experiencing this new contraption work. Now, this transformation of our idea of voice is really pivotal at this time. Perhaps no other technology really transformed our perception of our own voice. And in this, Walter Ong has often referred to this moment in history as the second orality. Whereas prior to this time, the only way you could record someone's voice was in a text. And now, for the first time, we can hear ourselves speaking back to ourselves. So how does this impact our understanding of the way the voice is represented in comics? To begin with, way back in the 1600s and before, the way in which people wanted to show this idea of a voice is they would represent it in the phylactery, this sort of twisting form of a scroll that would be coming out of the mouth and directed toward the person that was being spoken to, this way of capturing the physical presence of the speaker. Now, over time, as text became more commonplace and literacy grew, the idea of needing to distinguish the voice from text became less significant as people accepted texts as representing someone's voice. And instead of having those awkward bubbles cluttering up the page, they could just neatly put them down below the picture and include any dialogue they wanted in quotes. And so this transition took place about 1800 with Cruikshank. From that time up until about 1900, speech bubbles are really largely absent. They kind of appear here and there. But only in this moment do they come back in force. And it's with the coincidence of this arrival of the phonograph, the phonograph that allows for the voice to stand out and be recorded, be heard, independent of its speaker. And so the voice now has, in a sense, an, its own medium, and such is distinct from the way people actually write. So occult goes back and forth between using the speech on his shirt and using it as a speech bubble, making full-page cartoons as he did before, or in these sequences. He's starting to experiment with new things, 
but largely the big movers and shakers are other comic artists who pick up on this idea and run with it. So we have now the episodic sequential narrative with speech balloons and panel frames. And that is really where we can call the American comic comes into its own and would eventually influence comics all over the world. The two great publishers in New York at this time were Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. And these two men were in a fierce competition and they would buy out each other's editors and cartoonists and they were always sort of sniping and battling in their own press, trying desperately to outdo one another. Hearst was a West Coast publisher who was coming into New York and Pulitzer was a long-standing publisher. Both of them engaged in what would be called yellow journalism. Sensational news stories, exaggerated accounts, and lots of colorful comics as a way to lure readers to their papers. Now, some people have said that yellow journalism specifically refers to the yellow kid. And there is some debate whether that is indeed the case. In fact, the idea of yellow journalism, of course, is much older than the yellow kid. Uh, it goes all the way back to the moon hoax of the sun. And so when we look at this idea of yellow journalism, it merely is when a paper employs extra narrative events or ideas to promote itself rather than merely reporting the news. In a sense, it's trying to get a scoop or create news for its own benefit. Now, these two publishers, in their desire to create news that was ever more exciting, really drummed up uh, support for the Spanish-American War and published a lot of horrific and heinous reports of the evils of the Spanish. And they even promoted these anti-yellow campaigns because yellow was a color on the Spanish flag. So with this and other reasons, Occult decided that it was really not in his interest to continue to pursue the yellow kid. And it quietly disappeared. Occult was not quite done with comics, though. In 1902, he devised a new comic strip that it became quite a hit, and this was called Buster Brown. He had actually gone to the St. Louis World's Fair, and he had pitched this idea of this character to a number of companies, and it was the Brown Shoe Company that eventually picked it up, exclusive rights to using this character, and so that they were able to have copyright to use Buster Brown to sell their shoes. And this allowed Ocult an enormous amount of money. And he could then hire lawyers and secretaries to battle anyone who attempted to use this brand outside the Brown Shoe Company. Buster Brown is actually a much more middle-class character. He doesn't have that sort of street urchin grittiness that was always hanging about in The Yellow Kid. He's clearly middle, upper middle class. The humor is much more chaste. And this direction is really uh, the way many strips went in the American newspapers. They often began dealing with immigrants and the urban poor as they were focused in New York. But as the papers became and comics became syndicated, as papers all over the country began running them, they opted for a more broader audience that would understand what was going on and less New York focused. Buster Brown was a very powerful and successful character. And the shoes, even though the comic disappeared in the early 1920s, the icon of Buster Brown, I certainly remember growing up as a kid, is not used anymore, but the Brown Shoe Company still is in business and they made quite an effort to promote this brand. They even hired midgets dressed up as the comic character with a dog to go about door-to-door -to, -door to sell their shoes. In 